This is the Mondo Wise Podcast. I'm Dave Reed. We have two interviews in this episode. First, I'll talk to Mondo Weiss's Palestine News Director, Yumna Patel, about her new video report published today titled On the Brink, Janine's Rising Resistance. Then we'll hear from Ahmed Abuznaid, the Executive Director of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, about their legal battle with the Jewish National Fund. First, to the Janine refugee camp. On January 26, the Israeli army conducted a deadly invasion into the Janine refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. In the span of a few hours, the army shot and killed nine Palestinians. A tenth Palestinian died a few days later from injuries sustained during the raid. It was one of the deadliest single invasions into the Janine camp and in the West Bank in years. It came on the heels of a year-long effort by the Israeli military to quash the resurgence of Palestinian armed resistance. The Janine refugee camp has a long history of armed resistance to Israel's occupation. Yumna traveled to Janine just days after the deadly raid to speak to the people there and hear about what they experienced. Hi, Yumna. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So today we're publishing your new video report, On the Brink, Janine's Rising Resistance. What's happening in Janine right now, and what did you find when you went there? To answer your question, um, I'll answer it in two parts. So what's happening in Janine right now is essentially it's an extension of what has been happening in Janine for the past um, 20 plus years. But much of it is also primarily the culmination of what's been happening over the past year and a half, let's say. So um, towards the beginning of 2022, the Israeli army launched what it called Operation Break the Wave. And essentially, this was a large scale military operation to be carried out in the West Bank with a primary focus on Nablus and Janine. And the focus and goal essentially of this military operation was to quash um, a resurgence of armed Palestinian resistance that people were witnessing across the West Bank, but primarily, again, in two major hubs, being Janine and Nablus. And within Janine, the primary hub of armed resistance and just in general, armed struggle and confrontation towards Israel's military and the occupation is in the Janine refugee camp. And so The reason that we went there to begin with was in the aftermath of a deadly Israeli army raid that was carried out on January 26th. So the Israeli army went into the camp um, around 7 a.m. They spent a few hours there, but in the span of those hours in which they were allegedly targeting wanted fighters in the camp, the army the army actually shot and killed nine people within Mm. the span of just a few hours. And a few days later, a 10th person succumbed to their wounds. So it was one of the deadliest single events, single raids in a long time in the West Bank. And so it was this hugely significant event, not only in Janine and in the Janine camp, but also across the West Bank. And so we went there the day after to go and just get the story from people on the ground there in the camp. We wanted to, of course, know what happened during the raid why 10 people were killed, including two children and one woman. Um, We wanted to figure out why people were killed, what happened, the damages that were sustained by the civilian population in the camp and the neighbors um, who live around this home of the wanted fighters that were targeted. But also we were there really to get an understanding of the history of the camp and how that has influenced what we're seeing today, which is a rise and a resurgence of armed resistance groups that we have not seen since the the second intifada. Mm. And describe for people what it's like in, in these camps. When, when, when you say the Israeli military uh, went into the refugee camp, and conducted a raid and uh, buildings were damaged. These are densely populated spaces. Uh, j- just describe that for people who maybe aren't familiar with what that looks like. Yes. So the Janine refugee camp is one of over a dozen Palestinian refugee camps in the occupied West Bank. These refugee camps are essentially 
areas, or typically if you were even to go there, you would just think it was a neighborhood perhaps of the city. And so these refugee camps are home to the descendants of Palestinian refugees who were forced out of their homes in 1948 during the Nakba and during the creation of the State of Israel. And so the Janine refugee camp was established after 1948. And so for the past 75 years, Mm. Palestinian refugees, now you're talking about the fourth, even fifth generation of refugees, have been living in these refugee camps. At the beginning, back in 1948 and the 1950s, these camps were very much what you would typically think of a a refugee camp. So tents Mm -hmm. and sort of these um, non-permanent structures. But because the Palestinian refugee issue is very much um, an, an, an enduring issue that has lasted for 75 years now, the tents eventually became permanent structures, which eventually became multi-story homes and buildings. And so Palestinian refugee camps are extremely overcrowded. They lack basic and proper infrastructure. Um, The people who live there tend to be amongst the, the poorest populations within Palestinian society, again, because of the economic losses that they sustained during the Nakba that have continued to perpetuate their families and their communities for for generations. And so these are some of the most overcrowded, underfunded, underserviced, and poorest areas in Palestine. So that's not just the Janine refugee camp, it's Palestinian refugee camps across the occupied Palestinian territory and and the diaspora. Mm -hmm. But that sort of gives you an idea of what these these camps look like. So the Janine refugee camp is around 16,000 people living in an area roughly of around half a square kilometer. And Mm. so like other refugee camps, it's quite overcrowded. A lot of the homes are very close to one another. People are kind of piled on top of each other. And so what happened during the raid is the army targeted one specific home that these fighters were allegedly holed up in, these wanted fighters. And so the main sort of, let's say the main part of the confrontations and the fiercest part of the confrontations happened around this house, you know, Israeli troops used snipers, guns, rocket launchers, Mm. um, and all sorts of weapons directed at this house and the civilian homes around it. So this house was essentially the house that the fighters were in that belonged to the Sabah family in the Janine camp was essentially completely destroyed and Mm. bombed out. But it also affected all the homes around it. So we visited some of the neighbors and some of the people who lived around that home. Their ceilings and their rooftops were crumbling on top of them because Mm. of the sheer force that their homes took in when these rockets and other explosive devices were fired by the Israeli forces towards the Sabah family home. We actually met a woman who uh, you'll be able to see in the video. We interviewed her. The Israeli forces raided her family's home. They ransacked the house. They positioned snipers across across the house and on the rooftop. And they actually used this lady's kitchen, her kitchen window, as the launching point for the rocket launchers to fire towards mm. The Bach family home. So her home just sustained lots of damage, as did um, many of the other homes around her. And there's actually footage from the IDF of them firing the rocket launchers from the woman's kitchen. Yeah, absolutely. And we also include that. So we have this sort of parallel in the video where we show the perspective of this woman and her family and the damage that was done to their home, and also the perspective of the Israeli army um, and their 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 cameras that they used to also record the raid, which again, they regarded as a very successful, um, Mm. quote, anti-terrorism operation. In in the report, you interview on camera, a member of an armed resistance group. What was the process like to get that interview? What, What group did he belong to? Yeah, that's a great question. So the person we interviewed He was part of a newer armed group in the camp called the Janine Brigades, or in some translations, it's been translated to the Janine Battalion. Um, The Janine Brigade was formed in 2021 by 
armed fighters affiliated with the Palestinian Islamic Jihad movement. What the Janine Brigade has done, and this is very much tied to the, the nature of the camp that they live in, um, and the fact that there has always been this sort of cross-factional cooperation within the Janine refugee camp when it comes to resisting Israeli invasions into their camp, as we saw in the Second Intifada and also most recently. And so while the Janine Brigade was started by fighters affiliated with the Islamic Jihad movement, they have since sort of developed or in practice um, come to sort of include fighters from across different factions. So Fatah, Hamas, PFLP, other factions in the camp that fight together alongside one another under, Mm -hmm. excuse me, under sort of this branch of the Janine Brigade. Again, it is primarily affiliated with the Islamic Jihad movement, but it does encompass other factions. And they also do fight alongside the armed wings of other factions in the camp. And so this fighter that we met, he was a young guy. Um, You know, I would place him in his early 20s uh, as our, and that's sort of the demographic primarily of a lot of these groups. And you're seeing this sort of a younger generation of fighters come up inside this camp and also across Palestine. So we were really lucky to be able to, to meet with him. So we had, so just to give you a little bit of an insight into the process, you asked sort of what it was like to, to try to get that interview. Um, we had a, we had a local fixer with us who essentially in the lead up, you know, as soon as we contacted him the day before, so right after this raid happened, he was sort of working tirelessly to get in touch with these fighters who he has built contact with over the course of many years. And sort of, it was essentially just a waiting game. So communicating with them or finding ways to communicate with with them um, and sort of this back and forth until we eventually got an answer. And so our fixer was working for, you know, close to two days on this. When we were actually there, we spent most of the morning and afternoon um, filming our interviews and footage with other people in the camp. And then by the evening, we were pretty much just done and waiting to talk to this fighter. And so it was several hours of just waiting. Um, So phone calls back and forth um, until, and there was kind of a moment where we thought it wasn't going to happen. But eventually we got the okay. We were taken to an undisclosed location um, and were then given the permission essentially to do this interview Um, with this one fighter who seemed to be in his capacity as sort of a a spokesperson for the group. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously he was, our interview was conditioned on the fact that we would not show his face um, or reveal any details about his name, his age, where he lived, anything like that. Um, And as you saw in, in the final cut of the video, we also, put um, an effect over his voice, essentially, so to not reveal his identity. So that was also part of the conditions in which we were allowed to interview him. Yeah. We almost never hear directly from uh, uh, Palestinians engaged in armed resistance. Israeli military personnel are regularly featured in news reports around the world. Why did you want to speak to them directly? And after people watch the complete video, what should people take away from the exchange you had with him? As we know, oftentimes and throughout history and even in the present day, when we talk about Palestine in the media, rarely ever are Palestinian voices being given platforms or priority when it comes to things that are happening to them or that they are engaged with. And while in recent years, we've seen that start to change, you know, Palestinians are are starting to get maybe more airtime or more of a platform on, on, you know, in certain media outlets, although there's very much is still a, an, an imbalance. But one sector of the population that is still very much not heard from, but is frequently talked about 
are these armed fighters? You know, we see images of we're constantly in the West, we're constantly inundated with the images of, you know, the quintessential Palestinian terrorist, right? Mm -hmm. The masked gunmen. Um, We see their images. We hear Israeli military and security officials and political leaders talking about them. We see political pundits from, you know, all around the world talking about these Palestinians and these Palestinian terror groups and whatnot. But we never actually hear from those fighters themselves. And and it's also even within Palestine, within Palestine, Palestinian media and, and Arabic media, Arabic language media, it's not very common for people to actually interview these fighters. Um, you know, the, the fighters in Janine have mm-hmm. given some access just over the past year to more media outlets to interview them. So we're not the first, but it is still very rare mm-hmm. for people to hear from these fighters. And so clearly these fighters, these armed groups, as you know, especially in the past couple months, in the past year, are playing a huge role and an increasingly important role in the current sort of political landscape on the ground in Palestine. Their actions, what they're doing, um, what they're preaching is part of the conversation. And so we wanted to talk to them and we wanted to hear it directly from them, sort of, you know, who are you? What is motivating you? And, you know, what is your message to people? You know, we wanted to hear it from them. And so, one of the first questions that I asked this young man and he, you know, he was a young man. um, One of the questions I asked him was, you know, Israel and the rest of the world says that you are a terrorist and that you belong to a terrorist organization. And that when the army comes in to conduct these raids, it is, they are doing it in the name of counterterrorism operations and quote unquote, saving Israeli lives. And so I, I, I said, I asked him that, I said, you know, this is sort of how you're portrayed. What do you say to that? What do you think about that? And he acknowledged, of course, that they're aware of the fact that they are portrayed and sort of labeled as terrorists. He said, we know that this is what who people think we are. We know people say that we're terrorists. But this label of, you know, violent terrorists who just want to kill Israelis for no reason because they, you know, are maybe anti-Semites and hate Jews. He said, that's not the case. He said, we are not terrorists and we do not even acknowledge that sort of name that's been given to us because it's a name that was given to us by the occupier and by this Mm -hmm. state and colonial power that has been occupying us for the past 75 years. He said, so I don't even acknowledge that designation. And he said, we are not terrorists. The real terrorists are the Israeli army and the Israeli occupation who are coming into our camps, coming into our streets, coming into our homes on a nightly basis and killing our people. And he said that the world needs to know that we are not the terrorists, Israel is. And when I asked him sort of, What drives you and other young men like you to choosing this path? Um, Because it's a path that most surely will either end in your death or your imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Um, And he said, you know, we chose this path because of what I saw in my life. He said it was part of my personal convictions. And I made this decision because of everything that I've experienced since I was a child. He said, from the time I was a child, we witnessed raids, killings, executions, the imprisonment of our families, the destruction of our homes, and all of this oppression that led us to this point. In the last few days after you filmed, after you finished the filming for this piece, uh, Israeli settlers and military personnel have carried out attacks on Palestinian communities across the West Bank. Uh, We've covered this on the site. The Palestinian town Hawara suffered deaths and uh, widespread destruction of homes, vehicles, other personal property. Clearly, the hard right Netanyahu government is determined 
to increase the violence being inflicted on Palestinians. Uh, what do you and our reporting team there in Palestine see coming in the days ahead? It's hard to predict exactly how things are going to unfold, of course. But what we can say with certainty is that we are dealing with a right wing fascist government in Israel that has control over the lives of millions of Palestinians that for the past 75 years, have not had a say in this government or the policies that they put forward to control Palestinian lives and dispossess Palestinians from their land. You currently have some of the most extremist right-wing ultranationalist settlers who are criminals in their own right and have been accused and charged with terrorism because of their extremely racist and anti-Palestinian beliefs and ideologies, these settlers are now in the highest levels of the Israeli government. They're controlling policy. They control the police and the armed forces. They are the ones that are in control of how land is used in the West Bank. So that means more Palestinians' homes are being demolished while in turn settlement expansion is being promoted. And so we're at this point that, you know, this current government is not even trying to hide sort of what their goals are and what they're trying to do on the ground. As you mentioned, sort of what was happening in Huwara over the past couple of days. After what happened in Huwara, you had members of this current Israeli government celebrating the pogroms that happened in Huwara and calling for the the complete wiping out of this Palestinian city. And so what we've seen just over the past week and over the past few months is definitely an indication of things to come. I think the situation is going to continue to get worse. Settler violence that is backed and supported and promoted by the state is going to escalate. And at the same time, Palestinian resistance to that in many different forms is going to continue. The person that we interviewed in our Janine video, there were two pe- I mean, a couple people that put it very clearly. They said, as long as there is oppression and as long as Palestinian people are deprived of their rights to freedom and dignity, there will always be resistance to that oppression and to that violence. So as long as there is no safety and security for the Palestinian people, there will also be no safety and security for the Israeli people or the people of the world as well. And so I think that we can expect more of what we've been seeing, especially now with Ramadan coming up this month. Um, These sort of tensions and Things that we've been seeing in the West Bank are surely to spill over into Jerusalem and the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. So I think we have a tumultuous few months ahead of us um, everywhere. Yeah. Well, we will continue to cover it uh, on on MondoWise. Yumna, thank you so much for your work, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Dave. Now back to the United States. In 2019, the Jewish National Fund and a group of American Israelis sued the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights over its support for the nonviolent BDS movement. The U.S. campaign is a fiscal sponsor of the Boycott National Committee, which has ties to various groups in Palestine. According to the lawsuit, some of those groups are terrorist organizations responsible for firebomb attacks on land owned by the Jewish National Fund in Israel. Activists say this is simply the latest attempt to suppress human rights work. Earlier this month, Diala Shamas, a lawyer at the Center for Constitutional Rights and one of the attorneys representing the U.S. campaign, told The Guardian, quote, The goal here is to harass the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights. This is something that we're seeing more broadly, smearing human rights advocates with accusations of terrorism and efforts to drag human rights advocates and protesters into court into extended litigation that distracts them from their advocacy. In the Palestine context, we see that happening a lot, both in the United States and by Israel, end quote. 
In 2021, the case was dismissed by a federal court in Washington, D.C., but the JNF appealed and is now back in court. Mondo Weiss's U.S. correspondent Michael Aria spoke with U.S. campaign executive director Ahmed Abuznade about the legal proceedings, the history of the JNF, and the wider context of this fight. So in November 2019, the Jewish National Fund and several individuals filed a complaint against USCPR. Can you explain the claims of that lawsuit and the organization's response to those accusations? Yeah, I mean, you know, quite simply, it's it's really just, uh, and we'll get into this in a bit, but it's a part of the tactic um, by the Zionist and Israeli institutions to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And so in this lawsuit, they're essentially claiming that uh, due to some of the violence um, that some folks experienced uh, on the borders uh, with Gaza, um, primarily um, the burning of some trees through uh, incendiary balloons, um, they are alleging that uh, the U.S. campaign's support of the Great March of Return, uh, the U.S. campaign's relationship to the BNC, the, the Boycott National Committee, um, because of our relationships to, you know, supporting this activism and supporting um, the Palestinian leadership on the ground, leading the boycott movement, that we are somehow responsible for some of the damage that was done uh, via these these balloons. So it's really, I think, uh, baseless, uh, fraudulent, um, and and you know, if if it weren't for the intense um, pain of this. Um, issue overall, it would be quite laughable uh, to suggest that folks supporting a just uh, cause, a just protest, a just march uh, where people return to their lands are somehow, um, you know, alleged to have contributed to, uh, you know, some of the burning of crops that that these uh, Israeli settlers are alleging that they, they, um, uh, they were victim to. So it really is, again, if I was able to divorce it from the, the the immense pain that Palestinians face on a daily basis and are currently facing, it would be quite laughable. But of course, we take this very seriously. And, and you know, in, in relation to how we responded, uh, we acted accordingly. You know, we were able to get uh, wonderful legal representation by the Center for Constitutional Rights, um, and, and other attorneys that have also been throwing down because they believe in our cause and they believe that justice is on our side. And, and they believe, uh, just like the, the judge in the lower courts, uh, they believe that this, um, this lawsuit is meritless. I think a lot of our listeners probably know who J- JNF is and what they do, but for maybe some, if some do not, can you just briefly explain who... What is this organization, JNF? What are their politics? What's their agenda? You know, what's the history there? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, the JNF, uh, just like other Zionist and Israeli institutions, tends to promote itself as something that it is not, uh, very similar to the ADL. And so uh, Vice President Kamala Harris had talked about at APAC uh, how she remembers as a child, um, you know, collecting money in those small tin cans to plant trees uh, in Israel. And, you know, with, with messaging like that, you can see how a lot of people are fooled by the mission. You know, of course, many of us, um, particularly those of us who are interested in, you know, protecting um, the environment and, and, you know, creating a situation where we can see a, a viable future for humanity, planting trees sounds like a good idea. Uh, but in reality, the JNF plants trees to cover up historic Palestinian villages that were ethnically cleansed in the Nakba. And and historically, what the JNF has continued to do is to take up as much land as possible uh, for, the set, for the settlement of Jewish folks only. And so what that means is all of the land that the JNF has, requ- has acquired, you know, over the last hundred years um, has actually been a land grab. So a part of actually Zionism in action. Um, And JNF acquired land, again, is for the sole use of Jewish settlers, of Israeli Jewish residents. And so what that means is they're they're literally using it as a tool of ethnic cleansing, but a tool of ethnic cleansing that has 501c3 status and is able to get donations all across the U.S. and all across the globe. So it's very insidious, very dangerous, 
And so we're not shocked that the JNF then seeks to also use, um, you know, lawfare in, it, in its bid to, to defend its uh, colonization, its ethnic cleansing, and its apartheid. And of course, uh, we were excited to see this lawsuit initially dismissed, and we'll continue to fight it um, until the JNF is exhausting um, all of these means of attempting to cover up the atrocities. And to just, uh, you know, um, expand upon that, you know, this is now back in court. Can you, can you, maybe people who haven't been following the story detail, the legal proceedings up until this point, you mentioned, you know, there was a lo- court decision from the lower court, but now you're having to continue to, to fight this battle, obviously. Yeah, yeah, it's super important. I mean, you know, I'll say, uh, you know, I'm an attorney, but, you know, our attorneys will tell you that, you know, uh, even though you're confident in a case, uh, the legal um, system has to play out. And so we're very confident in our attorneys. We're, again, confident that justice is on our side. The rule of law is on our side. We, we're very confident that this is a meritless claim. But in the legal process in the U.S., um, when there's a dismissal, um, the opposing party is, uh, you know, at many times able to appeal. Uh, and that is exactly what uh, the plaintiffs did in this case. They lost the case. The judge described it as meritless, uh, but then they appealed. And of course, um, the legal process takes its time to play out. And so we um, we just heard oral arguments uh, two weeks ago in D.C. Uh, we think, we again, we had great legal representation. Um, primarily by CCR, but also other attorneys. Um, And we're confident that um, this D.C. Court of Appeals will affirm the lower court. But we we can't say that for sure, because, again, any any, you know, attorney worth their salt will tell you that um, these things are not guaranteed. And and although we're confident, we have to wait um, for the process to play out. So it could be a couple of months um, until a decision comes from the D.C. Court of Appeals. Um, but again, we're very confident. We have great legal representation. And, you know, I, I think we'll get into this in a second, but this is just a part of the, the many challenges that Palestinian advocates deal with. So we're not shocked, again, that they're attacking us using lawfare. Um, we're ready to stand up against it. And more importantly, we're going to continue to fight for Palestinian freedom. Yes, definitely. I mean, you mentioned it, but I, my final question here is if you could, you know, maybe talk about the wider context of this fight, we we see this quite a bit, especially over in recent years, as you mentioned, you know, lawfare organizations and um, civil rights lawsuits targeting, uh, you know, Palestine advocacy groups. And, you know, we've seen, you know, organizations like USCPR smeared um, for, from all kinds of angles. Can you just kind of talk about that wider context that, that this one lawsuit is taking place within? Sure. And before I get to the specifics, for us as a, as a Palestinian movement, we know as human beings that when someone cannot counter your argument, when they can't debate the actual facts and the ideas that you're presenting, you know, they attempt smear campaigns to attack your character, to detract from the real conversation at hand. And part of the ways that, you know, you can smear someone is not just online, you know, uh, such, you know such as, uh, you know, vehicles like Canary Mission. Um, attempting to allege that, you know, all of these folks who are advocating for justice and freedom are in fact anti-Semites, you know, and that allegation, you know, has obviously smeared so many people um, that have been attempting to advocate for freedom for the Palestinian people. But in addition to these libelous and defamatory attacks um, of labeling labeling someone an anti-Semite or engaging in anti-Semitism, for their activism for the Palestinian people. You've also seen lawfare employed. And again, what this is, is an attempt to throw everything, um, you know, at the wall and to see what sticks. And I learned that, you know, sort of framework in law school. And a lot of times, you know, this is the type of frivolous lawsuit that, you know, courts are supposed to immediately throw out, that lower courts are supposed to dismiss. Um, But because they have such a plethora of resources backing these Zionist institutions, you continue to see um, lawsuits such as that against the U.S. campaign. You continue to see the Israeli and Zionist institutions attempt to get legislation passed on the local, on the state. Um, Even within uh, entities such as the American Bar Association, when you look at um, the, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism and attempting to label those who oppose uh, Zionism as anti-Semites. So we continue to see that really this um, 
Israeli Zionist uh, coalition in the United States is desperate. They are desperate to keep the conversation away from the legitimate cause for freedom and liberation of the Palestinian people and instead are hoping to shift these conversations to, um, you know, continue to allege that people are anti-Semitic and that people are, in fact, um, you know, engaged in uh, terrorism, engaged in um you know, things that they can allow for a delegitimization of the Palestinian cause. And of course, again, this is because their, their framework, their, um, their theory, their ideology is so indefensible uh, that this is the only way they can, they can win in the public sphere. Well, thanks so much for joining the podcast. We really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Mike. That's our show. Thanks to Ahmed Abuznaid and the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights and Yumna Patel, our Palestine News Director, for joining us. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication with no paywalls. If you would like to support our work, please go to mondoweiss.net slash donate. If you're not a subscriber to this podcast yet, click that button so you get every new episode in your app of choice. Please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find the show. Finally, if you have any more feedback, send me an email at dave at Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with a new episode.